Just by a uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have noticed, well, let's see, yeah, there we go. Uh, how many of you have noticed that responding to disasters, just getting our arms around disasters has gotten a lot more complicated? You raise your hand. Can, can, can you keep your hand up for a minute? Can you look around the room? It is not you. <laughs> if anything, you should leave here today feeling like it's not just our problem. I don't know if you know uh, what this is. This was the chart that General McChrystal put up before the American people in Congress and said, when we understand this diagram, we win the campaign in Afghanistan. Uh, this is how a uh, health care claim is processed under the Affordable Care Act. I know we're moaning and groaning, but it took me a long time to find a chart on one page. Uh, this is the current immigration roadmap. This is the low-income government resources to help people get back on their feet again. Uh, this, these are a couple of charts on humanitarian relief. Global food system for getting food to a relief location. And FEMA's situation reports. As you can see, uh, we have a big problem on our hands, and it's called complexity. Too much data coming at us too quickly, and very, it's very, very difficult to turn that data into something that's actionable. This is Hurricane Sandy, and one of the government officials uh, happened to say that we spent so many years in developing this plan, and it was tossed aside completely. That org chart made no sense once Hurricane Sandy was underway, and neither did any of the planning. And so as much as we like to say, well, we've got a plan in advance, we've got a plan in advance, once the disaster hits, everybody knows what happens, right? We are navigating a thicket of complexity, according to Carly Fiorina, the former uh, head of uh, Hewlett Packard. Now, you might be asking yourself, how did we get here? How did we get to such a messy place for being so well informed and having so much valuable data? Why are things so complicated? And I'm going to give you a quick answer here, and that's because I'm to blame. I went to work in Silicon Valley in the 70s and 80s, and our entire focus at that time was data production and distribution. And we kind of overshot, you think? <laughs> we overshot our goal. We were a bunch of nerds who said, the more data, the better the world will be. We were very idealistic. And now, according to Eric Schmidt, the, the CEO of Google, we create as much data, as much information, every two days as we did from the dawn of civilization to year 2003. Okay, let's put that in perspective. That means Friday night, we go home, and by Monday morning, that entire universe of information has been recreated. So you might have heard that the problem is broken down into what we call, commonly call in the tech world the four Vs. The velocity, the speed at which the data is changing, which is in picoseconds now. The volume of these files that are coming to us. You've seen these multiple page spreadsheets. They drive me nuts. <laughs> I, I've gone to the point where I have to print them out. How many of you have done this where you've printed them out and taped them together? and put them in your office and they're larger than your desk and you're supposed to make heads or tails out of that. So by the 90s, we graduated, we realized, all right, data production, we can't just keep overloading people. We've got to have some way to have organic monitoring, right, like your Fitbit, where you're not having to do anything to have the data change organically, picosecond by picosecond, nanosecond by nanosecond. And we need some background analytics. And that's pretty much when search engines came into existence. We wanted to be able to get to you only the data you were asking for, when you needed it, in a format that would allow you to actually make sense of it, not a multi-page spreadsheet. Well, what happened? We overshot again. All of a sudden, there was a proliferation of new devices, right? Today, it's not just your cell phone. You've got a tablet. You've got a desktop. You've got, I, I'm guessing, three or four 
devices that you're using, and if you're smart, you've got some kind of software that leaks and updates them all together. It was so difficult to watch this proliferation of devices because along with the proliferation of devices, it meant that things were going to be speeding up and getting even more voluminous. And so we needed some kind of data visualization tools so that we could get to fact-based decisions. You don't have time to go through all the numbers and analyze them. And many times, all you may have is a bar chart, a pie chart, or just something that says, this is reaching criticality, or this is where I need to pay attention. But of course, those devices led to more velocity, more volume, more variety. And so, around, I guess it was 2011, how many of you saw the episode where IBM's Watson went up against the two most winning contestants, uh, let's see, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutner. One was the biggest prize winner and one was the largest number of episodes that he had won. Uh, how many of you saw that episode on TV? Okay, not very many of you because you're not nerds like me. <laughs> this was a nail biter for me. I actually knew some of the people at IBM that were working on this project, and I thought this was a PR disaster, a disaster waiting to happen. Why? Because if you've ever watched the game Jeopardy, what are the categories? You don't know what the categories are going to be. One, day, one category is U.S. postage stamps, then it moves on to uh, Indian spices, and then uh, Chinese history, and then... Uh, Nursery rhymes. And so I thought, how are they going to have a computer be able to respond to random categories? This isn't going to make any sense. And they said, ah, it's no problem, because Watson can survey all of the information that is on the internet faster than the contestants can ring in. And I said, oh, problem solved. Watson wins. Except for the folks at Jeopardy said, nah. They don't have access, the contestants don't have access to the internet. Watson doesn't get access either. And that was a problem because that meant they had to load data into Watson. Where do you start? So this was a nail biter for me. I thought this was the biggest mistake IBM had ever made on public TV. But of course, as you know, Watson won. And the scientists who had developed Watson quickly realized that they had more than a computer that could win a game show. They had a computer that could immediately go out and look at everything on the topic, old and new, and come back with just the information that someone needed. So if you happen to go into an ER in a hospital that's using Watson, this is how it works. Whoever takes you in in that ER doesn't have to be the best doctor in the entire hospital doesn't have to be the most skilled individual or the smartest. All they have to do is take all the information that's known about you, put it into Watson, and Watson will come back with percentage probabilities of what you're going to die of, of what your problem is. But here's the real value that Watson offers. Instead of saying, all right, those are the percentages of what this person probably has, Watson says, however, however, if you were to go get me this next piece of data, my, pro my diagnosis would go up 18 percentage points. So it acts as a pointer. It not only says this is the probable cause of this person's ailment, but also says this is the next most important piece of information. So there's no more guesswork about what you've got to go get next. And this is, Watson, in my, in my belief, this is big data's true value. It's the pointer that says this is what's important next. So these are a couple of things. Most of you are acquainted with big data, but what you may not know is when there's staffing shortages, you suddenly are raising the capability of all your staff when you turn to big data. Because it used to be that when you went into an ER, you better pray that the person who was going to handle you or take care of you was really a seasoned individual. Now it doesn't really matter who takes you in. 
right? It elevates everybody's capabilities. And more importantly, it makes the data actionable. So according to IDC, worldwide revenues for big data analytics are going to go from $150 billion in 2017 to about $210 billion. But I'm going to tell you something here. Somebody was asking me about big data. They want to launch a big data project. And I said, well, hold on. Remember I told you this. I said, hold on to your horses. Because in the next decade, we're moving away from classical computing. All the computing infrastructure you have today, everything you've invested in, all the software, all the customization, is in for a major disruption. Because nobody, as of this point in time, has a transition from classical computing to quantum computing. And I'm going to scare you a little bit. I'll scare you a little, and then I'll tell you why not to worry. How's that? Within the next decade, we're going to move to quantum computing. What is quantum computing? You'd have to be a physicist to really understand it. Quantum computing is based on the idea that an atom can exist in more than one state at the exact same point in time. So with classical computing, where you might be looking at a digit 101, in quantum computing, you would be analyzing all the pathways. What does this mean? This means we're not going to be doing things real quickly in a serial mode anymore. It means that you're going to ask a question or conduct an operation, and all possibilities will be examined instantaneously. Nobody's left the room. OK, I didn't scare you enough. How fast? How fast is quantum computing? Volkswagen Pilot uh, got together with D-Wave Systems, who was a quantum computing manufacturer, probably one of the more advanced uh, companies working in this area. They decided to take 10,000 taxis in Beijing and calculate the fastest routes through traffic to the Beijing airport. Using classical computing, it took about 45 minutes, between, 50, between 35 and 45 minutes. Using quantum computing, a fraction of one second. As a result, what's Volkswagen doing? They're working with D-Wave Systems now to develop the next-gen traffic system. If you are involved in logistics, operations, traffic, supply chain, you want to get in touch with Volkswagen and D-Wave Systems and get a piece of that, get on top of that. So what's going to come up next? What's the next great leap besides quantum computing? Well, it's predictive analytics and artificial intelligence. And what is predictive analytics? It automatically takes all of this data that we're generating faster and faster on more and more devices, and it's now going to look for patterns. It's going to connect dots in ways that we've never connected them before. We didn't know those patterns existed. We didn't know those problems existed. And we didn't know those opportunities existed. Predictive analytics doesn't just at, connect these dots together and find these patterns that we cannot see. But it also keeps adding dots every time new data is generated. And so it gets more and more precise because every new bit of information is allowing us new insights and far greater precision than we've ever had before. It's allowing us to predapt. This is my buzzword for the day, predaptation. What is predaptation? It means preemption. It means to quash, alter, or lessen undesirable events and outcomes before they even happen. Adaptation is to respond to a change in the environment. We're responding to an event that's occurring or, or has already occurred. But I would argue, and, and we can have a good debate out there at the book signing today, I would argue data is coming at you too, too fast. It's too voluminous. You cannot react on the spot. There's no way to do it, not even using big data analytics. You have got to get out ahead of that data. And that's a whole new mindset. And it's why they brought me in here today. Predictive models are being used to pinpoint events before they occur 
by insurance companies to estimate premiums, coverages, reimbursements, logistics, staffing, equipment and service needs, financial liability and risk. Everybody's trying to use models to get out ahead of the problem so they can do something in the present to avert that problem. Now when you think about it, we know more about what's going to happen in the future than at any other time in human history. We've never possessed this power before. And when, I, when you leave here today, I want you to really kind of think about what that means to know the future. We used to call in, you know, leaders used to call in kings and psychics and, and mystics to tell them what the future was so that they could win battles or they would want to know if their child was going to be a boy or a girl. Uh, they, they wanted to know about the future because it's such an advantage. It's a tremendous advantage. And when it comes to emergency response, it's the ultimate advantage. When you think about it, 20 years ago, if someone was pregnant, we, couldn't, we didn't know if they were having a boy or a girl. Now, with 100% certainty, we can tell people the sex of their child. Genetic testing is predaptive. You, you, I don't know if you said, did any of you see the 60 Minutes episode on CRISPR? The new genetic testing that's, that's come about? It's virtually instantaneous. You're going to have genetic tests for just about anything that you're curious about at your drugstore within the next decade or so. These are some of the diseases that we can test for immediately, right? In two weeks, you can have lab results back that will tell you if you're suffering from these diseases. And this is a small partial list. It changes every day. When you think about the future, think about automobiles. They stop ahead of a collision now. That's pre-adaptation. They aren't, we aren't trying to fix cars after they've collided. We're trying to stop them before they collide. And if you've got an MKZ Lincoln, you're in real luck because it turns out that the way that you steer and tap on the brake is different in traffic than it is when you're falling asleep at the wheel. The algorithm is different. And the MKZ Lincoln can tell that you're getting drowsy based on how you're turning the steering wheel and how you're tapping the brake. And a warning light comes on and says, pull over, you need rest. Imagine every truck in America having this capability, right? A lot of people, I used to go around and make bets. Uh, my top bet's a dollar, so I don't want you to think I turned me in for a gambling problem or anything like that. But I, I, I used to make bets with people, and I'd say, I can predict with an 86% certainty you're going to trip and fall in the next three weeks. And they would look at me and say, you know, Rebecca, for a futurist, you've gone off the deep end. That is absolutely impossible. But actually, we can predict that. Because sensors now, like a Fitbit on your ankle, can determine a very small five centimeter change in your normal walking gait. Who knew that preceded a fall? You, your walking gait will change. So how can we predapt to that? Very simple. We can send an alert and say you have an increased opportunity to fall in the next three weeks. It's very high. And you know if we start at 86%, you know how technology goes. We're going to go to 90%, 95%, and pretty soon 100%. I'm going to say 100% chance of falling tomorrow about noon. Yep, yeah, I'm on it. I know what's going to happen. We can alert caretakers and family and friends and coworkers. We can tell people, get into physical therapy and correct that walking gait. Use a walker and cane for support. Stay off of uneven surfaces. There's a lot of things we can do to prevent falls. And we know with the elderly, even, even these bags. Oh, I know they're not very fashionable. <laughs> Nobody wants bigger hips. I get it, I get it. You know, somebody will come up with a better looking one. But you know what? Also pre-adaptation. If you're not going to get off of uneven surfaces, the very least I can do is keep you from breaking your hip or taking a bad fall. And by avoiding falls, we've estimated that seniors can live independently an additional two and a half to three years. Because many times, those falls sentence them to assisted living, and, they, and they're never leaving. So my question is, how could we use that technology to avoid injuries during an emergency? Would we be able to apply that 
Which volunteer and staff members are exhausted, prone to falling, prone to having an accident? Some of the technologies I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later on are all preadaptive. They're all preventative. Knowledge is for power. You've heard in some of the other sessions about the GOES next-gen weather satellites, where we have now three times more data, four times more greater resolution, and five times faster data coming at us. Why is that important to us? If we can give people, this is Al Roker. He, he came on and he said, gosh, folks, if we could give people 10, 15, 20 minutes extra time, what does that mean? It takes so much of the work and the burden off of the responders. This is one of the images uh, that was of uh, Hurricane Michael recently. Very, very accurate image, and not only accurate, compare the forecast of where Michael was going to hit ground, when it was going to hit ground, the strength at which it was going to hit ground. Compare that to forecasts of hurricanes even five years ago. Right. This was a complicated hurricane, and we were able to give people plenty of opportunity to get out of town if they wish to. We're going to talk about that in just a minute as well. I happen to live on the coast. I recently moved to the coast of Oregon. I moved from Silicon Valley there. I thought I was leaving earthquakes. I discovered I moved to tsunami territory. Uh, and, I just, and the way I discovered this was I kept seeing these floats out there. And I started asking questions about the sirens, the evacuation routes. The more I looked, the more I saw that Oregon is, is highly prepared for evacuation in the event of a tsunami. In fact, Oregon is the only farmer's market I have ever went to that has these, these bubbles. They're selling them at the farmer's market for people. I had never seen one before. Two people can strap in, close it up, and it'll rise to the top. Again hoping to save people's lives. If you've never seen one before, they're kind of kinky. But in Japan, they're putting them on the tops of buildings and in basements um, as well to be able to roll out for uh, key executives and, uh, and family members. In Italy, more than 800 landslides occur every year. And there have been about 6,000 deaths in the last century. It's estimated to create about $1 to $2 billion of damage. Every year, Italy suffers these massive uh, landslides. And this has become an, uh, a bigger and bigger problem here in the United States as well. But their solution was to use these extremely, you know, we usually think about robots as being almost humanoid types of robots. But think of robots in terms of, these kinds of very massive scale robots, because I'm, I'm going to show you an example of a massive scale 3D printer in just a minute. This is a robo climber, and it secures mountaintops, drives pins into the mountaintops, and compresses the mountaintops. It's currently uh, being used in Switzerland, Italy, and a couple of other countries. If you want details on it, be happy to pass that along. Not only that, slope alarms. There are a number of high-tech companies working on slope alarms that listen to the slopes and, and, and anticipate shifting and movement. As a matter of fact, the other day, I had a very interesting conversation. This isn't on a slide or anything with a physicist who is now using uh, clocks as quantum sensors for land movement. Now, you, again, you have to be a bit of a physicist to understand this, but as, but time slows down as you move away from large masses. That's why time slows down. You've seen, a lot of you have seen the movie Interstellar, where you, know, you, go, you go to another planet and everyone, you come back and everyone, there, five generations of people have passed. Time slows down as you get, so what they've done now is they put these clocks around uh, geysers in Yosemite to see that as the mass, land mass, gets more and more intense, whether the clocks will show a different time than our standard clocks. The fastest atomic clock ha happens to be in Boulder, Colorado. They're going to measure those incremental differences. By incremental differences, I mean 10 to the 18th. So these are not differences we would notice. But we may be able to use clocks as uber quantum sensors 
to detect landmass changes and possibly early detection for earthquake. Not something you normally think about. This is the LIDAR light detection and ranging system. That's a bit of a geological test to look for structural uh, weaknesses and issues. Also very good for uh, detecting landslide uh, risk areas. Forest fires, we could talk about those. You all know there are specialists here in this room that know, and they can speak to this better than I can, that the number of forest fires and their magnitude are growing. And that happens to look, an I'm going to go backwards, it happens to look an awful lot like the global surface temperature of the Earth. I put these maps up for people that don't believe in climate change and go, isn't it funny that they look the same? So we may be shifting very shortly here, particularly on the west coast of the United States, from global warming to global burning. That's not a common phrase that we like to use, but that may be simply the case. Now, these are good responses, right? Cutting a, a perimeter is a good response. Uh, using these kinds of uh, uh, drops is a, it, are good responses. But drones are being used more and more often now to monitor and get into areas that we can't easily get into and we can't get close enough by plane. Thinning uh, forests, of course, those are predaptive measures. And here are some really interesting predaptive measures of using these kinds of fire barriers to protect structures. In Big Sur, California, where I used to live, there was a massive forest fire. And I write about this in one of my books, uh, where a fellow, a realtor, came up to me and he said, I was sitting there saying goodbye to my house. It was about ready to go. And uh, I had a glass of wine, and I was sitting on the porch, and it was the last time I was going to sit on the porch. And all of a sudden, for some reason, I started thinking about firewalls. What the heck is a firewall? Well, he was a realtor. He knew what a firewall. A firewall was a double, uh, two walls of sheetrock. And he said, why do we call that a firewall? Don't know why he thought that. Might have been the wine. So what did he do? He went into his garage and he grabbed a couple pieces of, of sheetrock and he built a fire in his fireplace and he started throwing the sheetrock in the fireplace and it wouldn't burn. That was all he needed. He got into his truck and he went down to Home Depot and he loaded up all the, all the sheetrock he could. And a friend of his loaded up his truck and they grabbed everybody they could and they started nailing sheetrock to the exterior of his house, to his roof, to his decks, to his windows, everywhere. It looked like a, a really modern, weird bunker kind of structure. I wish I'd gotten pictures of it, but I was too busy volunteering for the Red Cross at that time. His house survived. The ashes landed on the sheetrock and fizzled out. It looked weird for a while, but all the structures around him burned. We've now moved, in California, you can't get insurance for shake roofs anymore. We've moved to slate roofs or other composite materials. That's predaptive. And also from fire alarms and fire extinguishers to something I think you're going to love. Everybody know what a Roomba is? What's a Roomba? It's a vacuum cleaner. Well, take a look at this. This is a Roomba-based fire extinguisher. Right? The fire alarm doesn't go beep, beep, beep anymore. It dispatches the Roomba fire extinguisher to the location of the fire and immediately puts it out. If you think that's cool, raise your hand. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, preadaptation. What if we use drones to monitor wild, uh, wildfire areas that are difficult to get into, like national parks? We patrolled those areas before these fires began. What if we deployed larger scale Roombas in these areas that, could, that, were, that had heat sensors that were communicated to from satellite and immediately went into those difficult locations and put those fires out? This is a kind of out of box thinking we got to do. This is what we have to do. We have to let technology take us toward prevention, not response. 
You want to get creative, the largest retailer, I can't use their name, but you know who they are, largest retailer in the United States, when they tapped into weather information from NOAA, they discovered that when the temperature goes up, cows produce less milk. So what did they do? They locked in milk, milk prices ahead of all their competitors. They said, oh, the temperature's going up. Let's lock those milk prices in. So this data can be used in a number of ways, not only to avoid a negative outcome, but to get the jump on opportunity. Every minute of every day, our ability to look at a future event and quash that event from getting larger or happening at all gets more precise. This is a CDC uh, influenza model. You know, you've, many of you have seen this. It'll show how that influenza is moving throughout the United States. And so what do we do? We go out and we say, it's, it's coming to a state near you. Get your flu shots. And record numbers of people are getting flu shots today. And by the way, we can predict who is predisposed to become an opioid addict. You thought what I told you about detecting your normal walking gait was really pretty futuristic? Well, it turns out that there's a company called Fuzzy Logics that by looking at insurance claims, your medical history, your behavioral markers, can estimate that you are predisposed to become an opioid addict before you get that first doctor's prescription. And we now know that 75 to 80 percent of the people who are dealing with addiction today started on a legal doctor's prescription. We didn't need to let that happen. Addiction, we, we have, you know, I'm a scientist by training. I'm going to tell you, we don't have any cures for addiction. It's a devil of a problem to try to solve on the back end when we can avoid it on the front end. I don't know of a single person who wouldn't volunteer to be screened to see if they're predisposed for addiction. And in that case, the doctor could redirect them to different pain management. By the way, we can do the same thing to preempt mass shootings. What I'm going to talk to you about is kind of controversial. It's going to raise a lot of ethical and moral questions. We'll talk about that in just a minute as well. We know what the common traits are. Science knows. The other day, I said something. You know, every now and again, I do a lot of speeches throughout the year. And every now and again, something actually really smart comes out of my mouth. And I go, wow, OK, good. So I hope somebody wrote that down. The other day, somebody wanted me to talk about the current administration, things that were going on. That's really out of my bailiwick. I don't weigh in on politics or policy. But I said to him, if you want to know the opposite of politics, it's science. Science is the opposite of politics. Get out of the politics. Get into the science. Get into the data. We now know that these are common traits that the mass violence perpetrators all share in common. And in the case of Stephen Paddock, it was very clear he was reaching criticality. His father was a violent sociopath. That's a heritable quality. He was on the FBI's top 10 most wanted. He lived in 27 residences in the past 10 years. He bought 42 weapons. He tried to buy tracer rounds. He sent his girlfriend away. He was prescribed diazepam four months before it happened. If you have a history of violence or mental illness in your family, nobody prescribes you diazepam. He rented multiple hotel rooms. He was sleep deprived. He had erratic spending habits. All of these things were pointing toward criticality. The problem is we work backwards. The mass violence occurs. You know this is what goes on. You know it. The mass violence occurs, and we start working backwards. And we go, oh, they posted on social media they were going to do this, and they bought a gun, and then they did this, and they did this, and they did this. What good does that do us? It does us good if we're going to use that algorithm to prevent future issues. In social media, vocabulary is the new canary in the cold mine. We know the danger words. These are them. These are them. You can get this slide from, from the conference organizers. 
You start to see these words, you're reaching criticality. You see these words, they're well-being words. We know what the words are. We've tested them. We know who is in danger and at risk. Every minute of every day, we get better at identifying who's going to commit mass violence. But what are we going to do about it? Have you seen, how many have seen the movie Minority Report? Remember the precog police? When you were 99.99999% probable you were going to commit a crime, the precog police flew in and arrested you right at the second before you did. You went on trial, you were convicted, you got the same sentence as doing it. That's a problem. That's a problem, even for Stephen Paddock. Rented that hotel room in Las Vegas. Let's say he got all the guns up there. Let's say he loaded them all, put the cameras up in the hallway. Let's say he cracked that window. Let's say he pointed his gun into the crowd. He could have changed his mind. He could have sat back down on that bed, unloaded the gun, packed it up, and gone home. We don't know how many people that applies to. We don't really have statistics on that. It raises a lot of really ethical and moral questions. Are we going to arrest, charge, and try and convict individuals before the fact? Are we going to have forced evacuations? Are we going to use physical force to move those people out that won't move out of a disaster area beforehand? What about the permanent relocation of people where we're back there year after year after year rebuilding? Do we have a right to tell you you can't live there anymore? Because we can't support this rebuilding effort year after year? And when, when do you pull the plug on disaster relief? Because it's poverty relief. We've all been there. We've all been there where we've had to shut a shelter down and it was still full. But the problem wasn't the disaster. It was poverty in the area. Every advance in technology comes with ethical and moral questions. You can't avoid it. And if you just sit there and say, yes, but we don't want to do that because of the moral and ethical questions, you'll never progress. If we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be worried about identity theft or the hackers shutting down our grid. And by the way, the Wright brothers and Charles Lindbergh, when Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, he won a bunch of peace prizes. I don't know if you know this. He won a lot of peace prizes because it was believed that if you could transport heads of state from one country to another, it would broker peace. It would make, you know, face-to-face -face meetings are so much more important. And since he'd made it easier, this was going to broker peace. He wasn't thinking that these planes would be used to drop bombs. Nobody was thinking about that. So every time we make progress in technology, there is a dark side. There's a dark side. Fortunately, the positives outweigh the negatives. So let me run through real quickly some of the other predaptive technologies. Do you want to see some more technology? Raise your hand if you want to see more stuff. OK, we're going to get to the fun stuff now. Facial recognition software. How many people are using facial rec recognition software? Very few of you. There are 43 muscles in the human face. This is how we express pain, dishonesty, pleasure, happiness, joy, all of those things we communicate through our face. This is a very powerful interviewing tool. If you're not using it when you're interviewing staff and volunteers, wouldn't you like to know when they're exaggerating? Wouldn't you like to know when they're deceiving you? Wouldn't you like to know if they're dangerous? You cannot tell that by just trying to read the cues from what you know. But you can tell that using facial recognition software. And by the way, this software is down to a few hundred dollars. So don't tell me you don't have the budget to implement it. You simply have somebody sign a photo release that their interview is going to be videotaped, and you run the facial recognition software afterwards. It's a fantastic new training tool, by the way. In one classroom out on the East Coast, they have facial recognition on all the students. All the students. And in the back of the classroom, there are percentages running that the teacher can see how many students got that lesson. So in real time, they can say, well, a lot of you didn't understand what I just said, so I can go back. I can go back and reteach it. And you can identify which students are tuned out, right? It also distinguishes those who are in actual serious pain 
from those who think they're in pain. That's a form of deception. So using facial recognition on clients, on staff members, on others, is a good way to get a true reading. By the way, I was just at MIT Media Lab, and I believe that this will be, bring an end to all marriages. <laughs> this is a device called subvocalization. You only have to think the word, and it says it. It says the word, I want to just be clear you get it, it says the word you think. This is the end. <laughs> this is the end, folks. So I put it on, of course, because, you know, I like to do animal experiments on myself. I put it on, and I thought one word and said the other, and the word I thought came out, and I said, okay, this is the end of civilization. Drones. Most of you are familiar with drones, but I'm going to show you a couple of drones that you may not be familiar with. The little dragonfly drone. I was at a conference not long ago, and they had the dragonfly drones in the lobby, and they were surveying attendees like yourselves on the speakers. The speakers didn't like it. Because some people were going, oh, that was so boring. Oh, uh, that, I wish she'd talked more about this or that. But it was really good because it could give uh, um, feedback back to all the speakers. I really liked it. But it was collecting those words, those social media words. It's telling you canary in the coal mine. Canary in the coal mine even in your own office. Um, for shelter-in-place emergencies, how are you going to get medicines, food, everything to people? You've got to think about drone delivery. In Canada, Amazon launched a drone delivery system. It's fantastic. It, it's so cool. There's a video. I think it's up on my website, but if not, you can see it on YouTube. The drone arrives. It opens up the package. The person takes the book out. And here was the best part. It took the box away. It was cool. Took the box away, reused the box. So that's pretty cool. Timely, costly uh, uh, way to get medicines and, and uh, supplies. In fact, it's the fastest transport for blood. If you have an emergency that requires blood, Stanford Blood Center is the first to be authorized to deliver blood in the United States to where it's needed. This is the Matternet drone. You can see it's in a secure compartment. If you need to know more about this, you can go to Stanford Blood Center and get the details on this. It's very interesting because all the venture capitalists and Silicon Valley successful people live in the Palo Alto, Atherton area. And it's so funny that they're throwing, they're pitching a fit that they don't want blood flown overhead because the kids are playing in the yard and, and they distrust it. And I'm thinking, wow, there you go. The opposite of, of science is politics, right? This is a military medevac drone. It's, been, it's now going into commercial production. You're going to see more and more of these, particularly in those cases where you have elderly homes that just, they don't get their people out in time. You know, it's been the worst PR nightmare for everybody, right? And, and we can get them out. We can get them out. But we're not going to get them out with canoes and rafts and, and vehicles. You know that. Can't get them out that way. But you can get them out using these uh, medevac drones. And you can see some other drones for large shipping containers to get ice into uh, uh, emergency areas, to get medical supplies into emergency areas, foods, that type of thing. Mercedes has now uh, introduced their first drone van. It has a runway at the top of the van, and it has four or five drones on it. And you can keep a, a van on the freeway, and the drones dispatch from the freeway to wherever they're needed, and then they relocate the van and come back to the van. And Amazon has also filed for the first dirigible, so that they're going to be flying supplies over to disaster areas and dispatching drones from that, those locations. Rescue drone applications are going to become more and more familiar. We don't really have a single drone that, that has enough cargo carrying capability. So as a result of that, you're going to see that you, you go, you're going to see multiple drones strung together in a modular uh, configuration. And of course, the new uh, Lockheed Martin jetpacks, these are way outside of the scope of practical budget, so don't put it on your requisition. But I do want to give you, I, part of my job as a futurist is to give you a little glimpse of what you're going to be looking at over the next 10 years. Change is a coming. It's coming, but in a fun way and in a good way. 
These are not quite practical yet, but they are working on perfecting them. What is practical are the flying cars. This happens to be a picture of Aeromobile. They're in Slovakia. They're the first to commercially produce cars. Anybody want to take a guess about how much these are going to cost? Anybody? Just million dollars? 300,000? Their target price is 150,000. If you haven't seen this video, go to YouTube. They're in mass production right now. This is one of them. I am not in this flying car. You need about a football field to land in, about here to the back of this room, to take off and land. How does it work? It looks like a really elongated Prius. And then uh, when you get ready to fly, the wings come out, and it switches into plane mode. It's not really a flying car. It's a, it's a car that switches to become a plane, and then switches back to become a car. And the reason for that is because to have a really good operating car, you want downward uh, weight. And to have a really good and safe plane, you need lift. And these things contradict each other. So what you needed was a switching device. Turns out the first patents for flying cars were introduced in 1917. And every year, more patents were introduced. And they kept trying to put them together because fundamentally the engine is the same. And they kept trying to put it together, but it was never working very well. It was either a really crappy running car or a really dangerous plane. And so Aeromobile was the first to say, nah, nah, it's never going to work. Everybody's went down, gone down that road. What we need is a switching device. And uh, you've got to see this because the founder, get, he's driving down the road in this funky looking car. He pulls off to the side, flies, goes over the traffic, lands on a dirt strip, and uh, gets back into traffic again. So you might be saying, well, what about power? You need power to run those. You need fuel. Well, in my book, The Watchman's Rattle, one of the, thi one of the chapters that got the most attention is NASA's space-based solar system uh, for fueling energy. A lot of you have heard about this. The best place to collect so uh, energy is actually uh, where we don't have atmospheric uh, interference at all. And I can tell you a lot more about that a, a little bit later. They initiated this program in 1999, and it allows for continuous power all around the Earth. Uh, and it's environmentally friendly, no pollution. It's pretty much free. They're going to charge a nominal amount to, to keep the grid operating. But they're already doing a lot of testing right now on space-based solar, if you're not up to date on that. And by the way, I'm going to stop here for just a minute and tell you any of these things I'm talking to you about, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com. The last page on my website is a contact page. If there's any information about any of these or who to contact or or you're having institutional resistance, because that's going to be the biggie. Institutional resistance is a big deal, even if it's a good idea. Lots of good ideas die for bad reasons. If you're running into those kinds of things, just reach out to me. New generation of embedded sensors. You know Fitbit, but you might not know that these sensors are going into hospital gowns. They're getting fitted into clothing. It's a really interesting concept. What kind of clothing are you giving your volunteer workers? It would be very good to give staff and volunteer workers clothing that has sensors in it that's monitoring their vitals so that they're not becoming dehydrated, exhausted, nutrient deficient, right? sleep deprived. You can measure all this from one central location. So it will be very important to give them jackets, shirts, that kind of stuff that could be monitoring the health of, of people that are, you're working with. Handheld sensors for testing the efficacy of food. If you've not seen these, they're pretty much all over the internet. They're very cheap. They're 100 bucks, 150 bucks. They really do test uh, the freshness and the bacteria level in food. We don't need to be putting thermometers in and going, all right, how, you know, is it the right temperature now? How much temperature loss has it, has it experienced? We don't really need to do that anymore. These things fit on a keychain, and they'll, they are highly accurate. Labels. Labels are, smart labels are coming along. If you've never seen a smart label, you know, you go to the drugstore, and if you have to take a pharmaceutical, they give you that fan fold thing. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? You open it up, and you can't possibly make heads or tails out of the thing. Well, 
Smart labels have really come down in price. You'll see them on a number of foreign products as well as Johnny Walker liquor, whatever. You just take your cell phone and you tap the label and anything you want to know all the way from source of ingredients, the actual location that the food was produced, where it was processed, that entire food chain, that supply chain, is all available to you. And soon you'll see all Starbucks foods and coffees will have smart labels on them so that you can trace all the way back to source of origin, their um, compliance with organic growing methods, their compliance with child labor laws, all of those things will be, will be available on a smart label. This happens to be a smart label for a smart diaper. Don't do what I do. I, I go to, you know, sometimes I, I forget myself because I'm a scientist and I'm at a party and I start telling people we're wasting a lot of urine and people begin moving away <laughs> from me. You know how many things we test, you know. You go to the doctors and they have you pee in a cup. Why do they do that? Because it's a phenomenal diagnostic test. We can tell if you're dehydrated. We can tell if you've got diabetes, sugar in your urine, you have an infection. It's fantastic. I single-handedly should have bought this company. I have to tell you because I, I have gone to more conferences where I've said, look, on the elderly and on babies, put these diapers on at least once a day, and all you have to do is, once they're wet, you just take a picture with your cell phone, and your cell phone does the analytics. Is that cool? If you think that's cool, yeah. That avoids UTIs, urinary tract infections that many of the elderly die from because it migrates to their kidneys before we catch it. All of these things are preventative. And self-expiring drug and food packaging is coming your way. It's so incredible. You see this top uh, bottle that's got the brown spots on it? That's modeled after a banana. As a banana gets old, it gets brown spots on it and eventually turns all brown and you don't eat it. You use it for banana bread, right? Well, these labels, they fade. People can't read them. They misread them. But you can't misread a bottle that's gone brown or a food package that's gone brown or has spots on it. And so the bottom is a blister pack, same, same uh, concept. By the way, the FDA has approved the first 3D printer for medicines, for an epileptic uh, seizure medicine. I'm not going to get a lot into this, but you need to know about 3D printing because everything that you create, whether it's food, housing, clothing, furniture, beds, mattresses, all going to be created on 3D. You aren't going to be doing this through supply chain anymore. This happens to be a pill that's created for a person who needs fast absorption. Absorption depends on porosity and volume to surface uh, area. So when you think about it, you go to the pharmacy today, all the pills are the same size. But the way that he metabolizes is different from me, is different from her. And some drugs we want to go into the system very, very quickly, and some very, very slowly. And so these pills will be manufactured custom to your metabolism at your local pharmacy. They will no longer be giving you a standard size pill. You can see an example of the pill being created there. You can see body parts being created in surgical centers today using 3D printing, dental, prosthetics, food. You know that we're creating artificial meat now, steaks, meatballs. I have one of these printers at my house and everyone's afraid to eat off of it. And also think, think outside the box, custom tools, replacement parts in the field. You don't have to transport them. You don't even have to use a, an Amazon drone to get them there. You can actually print them out, whatever parts you need. Get into 3D printing if you're not into it. You can see there, there's an engine block that's been printed, some clothing, some furniture. And when it comes to shelter, and we've all been dealing with this. Take a look at that. Under $4,000 to build a 600 to 800 square foot home within 12 to 24 hours. It comes with electrical and piping already in the wall. It clicks together. 
All that's required is septic. It's using a large format 3D Vulcan printer. The printer's up in the, lower, uh, the upper left-hand corner. You see there's this two-story building that was created. Get a picture of the inside there. Ten new homes are being built in China every day. Every day. And people are moving into them, and they're forming communities and villages and neighborhoods using this. Now, at a cost of three to four thousand dollars, you tell me, compare that to the cost of trying to get a mobile trailer down for temporary housing when we could give people permanent housing. We could rebuild these communities for cheaper than we bring in temporary housing. And I'm happy to talk to you more about that. Robotics are coming your way, you know about that, for lifting. It's really hard. You know, I used to work for the Red Cross. I, I volunteered for 25 years in the field for the Red Cross. And I tell you, I'm 63 years old. I can't lift cases of water all day anymore. I want to. There was a, a, an old movie where a, a dog was getting older in a Western. It was a Western called Open Range. Anybody see that movie? Well, it's, a, it's a Robert Duvall's in it and... Uh, Kevin Cosner, I'm fond of both of them. And uh, they, were, they were in this film, and the dog was getting old. And finally, uh, one of them said, uh, she's got the will, but not the legs. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Right? But you can see that lifting, dressing, clothing, the first robots will likely be companion robots. I was just on a stage two months ago with Sophia. Uh, I got to interview Sophia, the first artificial intelligence robot. She has synthetic skin. She's better looking than me. I didn't like that. <laughs> she blinks. She has expressions. And she even has a default position. It's really funny. If you ask her something, I was kind of clowning around with her, and I said, well, who's funnier, Ellen DeGeneres or Jon Stewart? And then she went, indeed. <laughs> Very polite. That was a close-up picture of Sophia. She doesn't have walking down quite yet. I wa uh. Lightning fast data collection going on. She has facial, facial recognition. When you think about humans, we start over each time a human's born, right? They got, we had to learn math, how to add, subtract, divide. We had to learn alphabet. Sophia, I will run into her 10,000 years from now and she'll say, hey, Rebecca, how, how was that emergency managers association uh, uh, convention that you were going to. Weren't you going to that last time I saw you? She'll remember my kid's name. She'll remember everything. Artificial intelligence doesn't forget. It's cumulative, right? It's cumulative. It, initially, we'll probably see these robots for lifting functions, for mechanical functions, and also for companionship. I also want to point out holographic imagery for teaching remote teaching for remote medical advice. You know, we, we now have uh, remote access from your cell phone and also from uh, your computer as well. But this is what holographic imaging is going to look like. Apple now has a phone under works that will actually holographically transport any individual. Makes all the difference in the world. And then uh, blockchain technology. I'm not going to get a lot into blockchain because it's like quantum computing. It's like a, 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 you know, a dark hole we start to go down to. Um, blockchain is basically an append-only ledger of all of the transactions that have occurred along a supply chain or along uh, any transaction. I'm not going to get into this uh, a lot because there are other people that are talking about blockchain at this conference right now. But if you're in supply chain management, quality assurance accounting, you're responsible for smart contracts with your suppliers or peer-to-peer -peer transactions and you're concerned with security, you need to start looking at blockchain technology ASAP. ASAP, because it was started in the Bitcoin world and it's probably the most secure um, ledger of transactions that we have to date. We don't have anything better than this for security. But I, I want to just bring up that a lot of the things I'm talking about are really cool, they're really futuristic, they're things that you would like to do, you may not know how to get started on these things. I have a, a, a tutorial workshop, it's, I'm not selling you anything, it's free, it's completely free, on how to get started in these technological areas.
just contact me and we'll do it over Skype with you and your teams. Happy to do that. Predaptive uh, innovation doesn't always have to cost an arm and a leg, and it certainly shouldn't make you fearful. For example, thanks to our, uh, you know, um, predictive analytics, we've been able to d uh, discover that prolonged standing is as dangerous to us as prolonged sitting. And so introducing the wearable chair. This is the coolest thing. It's the coolest thing. You walk around after a while, it takes you a couple days to realize you've got one on. And then all you do is you just make this notion and it locks into place. And it's not only for people that have difficulty getting around. It's literally for anybody who's standing all day. And we have a lot of volunteers and a lot of staff members that are, during a disaster are standing continuously. These are very inexpensive kinds of preadaptive tools that really take the pressure off their spine and off of uh, future locomotion issues. So to wrap up, the future is not an extension of the past. We are Pavlovian by nature. When something succeeds, we humans are designed to repeat it over and over and over again. Even when it stops working, we keep doing it. We know people like that, right? That's what we're designed to do. It's positively reinforced. But that doesn't work anymore. We can't keep doing what we've been doing before because the number of disasters and their magnitude are growing. So we have to do something different. And the four Vs make it impossible to adapt after an event has already occurred. This is the co-chair of the New York governor um, post-Sandy Commission. And he said, hey, we've got the planning documents. We've got the frameworks. But we can't really adapt after the disaster occurs. Technology reconnaissance can't be left to chance encounter. You have to have a deliberate program inside your organizations that says, we're going to go out and look for the best, and we're going to create pilot programs, and we're going to institutionalize technological preadaptation. What is our process about learning about and adopting innovation? Who's responsible in our organization for this futuristic stuff, right? What's our organization's real metabolism for change? For some of you, not very much. How do we manage institutional resistance? People who say, yeah, but we might be using those planes to drop bombs, so maybe we shouldn't build planes, right? Yeah, but the internet could lead to shutting down the grid, identity theft. Maybe we shouldn't have the internet. When it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people. There are those that let it happen, who make it happen, and then those that wonder what happened. So in conclusion, according to Aubrey de Bray, the University of Cambridge, the first person to live to be 1,000 years old is already walking the planet. I made the mistake of putting this up as my first slide at a pension fund conference. <laughs> I thought they were going to kill me. One guy shot his hand up because we don't even have a pension plan for a hundred year old. And if this is your whole present, I said, well, I'm going to show you what you can do about that. But yeah. So that, what does that mean? That means more people, more data, and more ways. But the highest instrument of our evolutionary inheritance as human beings is to do thought experiments, to use data, to use knowledge, to get out ahead of problems, and then take an action today to completely quash a negative outcome, or lessen it, or prepare for it. Three things we can do. Avoid it, lessen it, prepare for it. And we are the only species walking the planet that has that capability. Think about that. That's mind-boggling, that we can change the future by knowing what that future is. And preadaptive technologies are really changing the future of emergency management. I want to thank you all for the hard work that you do and for the millions of people that you help every day by the work you do. And also to remind you, I'll be out here to answer your questions. And please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any future questions. Thank you.